I'm, I'm interested in terms of as a scientist, uh, what, what defines a, a healthy microbiome? What are the characteristics of a microbiome that are healthy? And then when you say disruption or people talk about dysbiosis, what is actually changing in the, in, within the microbiome or within the gut in general that, that is perhaps leading to inflammation and perhaps uh, influencing some of these disease states? Yeah, fantastic. So the, you know, this question of what is a healthy microbiome is an incredibly difficult question. And it's, it's actually the key question that the, you know, all of these projects that started sequencing the microbiome that they sent out, set out to address, you know, uh, 10 to 15 years ago. And the, the thinking at that time, which was very reasonable, was that if we sequence the microbiome of a bunch of healthy people, we should have a pretty good idea of what a healthy microbiome looks like. And as comparison, you know, sequence the microbiome of diseased cohorts, you know, people that are suffering from different diseases, and that should give us kind of this frame of reference of healthy versus diseased. What we've come to realize is that even healthy people, um, have an increased likelihood of developing a chronic inflammatory disease or developing heart disease or, you know, developing one of these kind of Western diseases, one of these non-communicable chronic diseases. And it um, leads to the question of whether um, the microbiome of a healthy person is not actually a healthy microbiome. It may actually be a microbiome that's predisposing them to these different diseases. And so then the question, becomes um, how what is the way to develop to develop an idea or a concept of of a healthy microbiome or features that you might find in a healthy microbiome and so there are different approaches to this now so we don't still don't have an answer to your question but some thinking is if we go into populations that are pre-industrialized mm -hmm. and look at their microbiomes before they get exposed to antibiotics or um, you know have a, a bunch of perturbation to their microbiome we may get a sense of the mm -hmm. gut community that's better adapted to our biology. And so there's a, a large effort now to understand microbiome more globally in different mm -hmm. populations that live traditional lifestyles. Um, but I think that, you know, there, there definitely is within just an industrialized um, world uh, um, or within the industrialized world, a concept of what features in the microbiome partition with, um, more severe disease states and those that are associated with healthy people. That doesn't mean that those features are a healthy microbiome, mm -hmm. but it does mean that they are in, you know, healthy. seen in any health. Is some of that work uh, in traditional non industrialized communities uh, being done with groups like the Hadza? Yeah, exactly. So we've done some work on the Hadza gut microbiota. So the Hadza. Um, or a group of uh, hunter gatherers that live in Tanzania and um, you know, or they are undergoing rapid lifestyle change. Now there's just a lot of um, factors impacting their lifestyle, um, but they do live a life a lifestyle that is primarily based on, um, you know, hunting and gathering and their microbiome is much um, more diverse. It has more species. It has different species of bacteria present than industrialized populations. And what's really interesting is um, many of the bacterial species that we see in the Hadza, we also see in other hunter gatherers found in other parts of the world that you know have been um, separate from the Hadza for um, up to you know one hundred thousand years or more. So um, these are you know appear to be features of the microbiome that are more representative of what humans microbiome may have looked like throughout our evolutionary history. And therefore maybe what our human genome has come to expect and adapted to for a microbiome. So there may be some really interesting information in these traditional populations, microbiomes in terms of what is healthy. Mm -hmm. um, but, but there are also are higher incidence of um, parrot, you know, um, what we would consider intestinal parasites in many of these populations. So potentially some bacteria or other um, pathogens, parasites that can cause a disease and inflammation. So, um, you know, we, we have to be careful about what we conclude. We also have to be careful about, um, things like bio process, bio prospecting or biopiracy. Um, these traditional populations quite often leave, lead a very vulnerable existence. And, um, you know, all of the research is, um, needs to be carried out with a, a, a lot of consideration of these populations mm -hmm. in mind. Yeah. For sure. You mentioned uh, diversity 
I'm interested in, in microbiome diversity as a scientific term and how you think about it. I know that that's a word that I think is thrown around a lot now and a lot of people are probably familiar with it, but again, it does seem like it's open to interpretation. So as a, as a microbiome scientist, what, what does that mean to you? Yeah. Um, let me, so let me explain kind of how I think about diversity and then I can talk about it in the context of these different kind of populations and healthy and disease states. Cause I think that helps contextualize it. So d- d- when we talk about diversity, there are different ways of thinking about measuring diversity, but you know, a very simple way to think about it is just, you know, a, a jar of jelly beans um, and where each jelly bean represents a different microbe in your gut microbiota. And so if you only have, you know, uh, red, red and green jelly beans, um, you in your jar, that's a very low diversity microbiota compared to one that has many more colors in it, like, you know, orange and blue and purple and so forth. And so, you know, I think the, just thinking about the different species that are present in the gut microbiome is um, one easy way of thinking about diversity. And if we just, for instance, count the number of species, the, these kind of different colors that are present in our, in our gut microbiome, um, we uh, can see quite often the trend is that people with more diverse gut microbiomes are healthier. They have lower markers of inflammation, better metabolic markers, and quite often people that are in disease states, either metabolic syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, um, several autoimmune diseases have less diversity in their gut microbiome. Now, this always leads to the question of whether it's causally related to the disease or it's a product of the disease, whether it's upstream or downstream. And there's different pieces of evidence pointing to the microbes contributing to these diseases that we can talk about um, if, if there's time, but I, I think that, you know, in this spectrum of Western microbiomes, it appears that more diversity quite often mm-hmm. couples with health and quite often couples with a healthy diet. Now, if you go into like the Hadza or some of these other populations that live traditional lifestyles, there's even more diversity on top of that. So uh, mm-hmm. a greater extent of diversity and um, less chronic inflammatory diseases, even though many of these populations live to you know, fairly old ages, um, it, it appears that they, um, you know, don't suffer from these same sorts of, you know, what we call Western diseases, um, as people that live in the industrialized world. Now, the, um, the issue of diversity is an interesting one because there are disease states, for instance, in the vaginal microbiome that are associated with too much diversity. So it's not always the case that more diversity is better. There are ways that ecosystems, microbial ecosystems can go off the rails and gain too much diversity in the wrong way. But a very general rule is that in the context of the industrialized microbiome, more diversity is generally coupled to better health. You mentioned inflammation there. And again, that kind of feeds into this study here. Uh, I think uh, people will be familiar with, uh, you know, intestinal permeability and, or uh, leaky gut. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, how does, how does all of this come together? If you have disruption of the microbiome and say loss of diversity, how is that potentially affecting permeability and inflammation there, you know, it's, um, a a great question. And I think the, it's not an intuitive one to think that, you know, their gut microbes and what they're doing and what, what uh, species are present can directly impact our immune system throughout our body. Right. I mean, the, um, ability to fight off a respiratory infection or even for an immunotherapy to work in cancer, they've shown, um, at, at distal sites in the body away from the gut can be directly impacted by the microbes that you harbor in your gut. And one, reason is that the microbes in our gut are constantly conducting metabolism. They're growing, they're helping us digest our food. And in doing so they're secreting small molecules that then get taken up into the bloodstream. So all these little microbial metabolites get taken up into our bloodstream and affect our body and, and, you know, can circulate throughout our body and affect sites that are distant from the gut. So it's important just to recognize that even though the microbes themselves are largely confined to the gut, um, they can influence mm. the rest of our body through secreting these little chemicals. Now, it also is true that the microbes in our gut 
um, can use the mucus lining of our gut as a backup food source. So that mucus lining that I was telling you about is made up of carbohydrates can also be used as a food source for the microbes. If we're not feeding the microbes, if they're not taken care of with like, you know, a high fiber diet, for instance. And so as the microbes start to um, rely on this mucus lining for their own sustenance, they can actually erode that mucus lining. They can start pressing closer to our intestinal cells. They should be away from the intestinal cells, but as the mucus disappears, they get closer and then inflammation can result as they get too close to the intestinal cells. So that's, for instance, one mechanism by which microbes in our gut can incite inflammation. But then the leakiness is a whole other issue that's incredibly complicated where um, that barrier that is supposed to keep both microbes and then other macromolecules, other components of our diet and components of microbial cells away from our cells and, and out of our bloodstream, that can start to break down if our interaction with our microbes is not what it should be. And that leakiness can lead to molecules getting into our bloodstream that then um, promote inflammation rather than dampen it. So if you have a healthy gut, you have microbes that are away from the, the colonic cells. There's a nice healthy mucus layer. The microbes are conducting metabolism where they produce short chain fatty acids, one of their metabolites that, that actually dampens inflammation and the, the system is in harmony. If you have a microbiome that's eating mucus, getting too close to your epithelial cell lining in your gut, and they're not secreting those short chain fatty acids, you end up with a degraded barrier. You can end up with molecules leaking across and, and uh, heightened inflammation that can drive, uh, we believe Western diseases. I should note there on, on the point about the, uh, microbes eating the mucus mucosal layer, there's a, a great YouTube video that your wife did, uh, Erica, uh, where she discussed that. So I'll put that into the show notes. If anyone, anyone wants to kind of explore that a, a little bit further. 